Good morning. We're going to start off, like I said, with something a little bit different. To contrast what we've been, we've been talking about the Lord, we've been talking about creation, we've been talking about everything God has done, we sang about His wonderful works, He's God of all creation, etc. this morning. And we're going to, I thought that came on. Ah, it did come on. Lights, please. We're going to talk about the opposite of God, the opposite of Christ, and what the world is involved with to quite an extent. <clears throat> and so, basically speaking, the occult, the word occult means that which is hidden. The word cult, C-U-L-T, comes from occult, like people who are teaching unchristian things, yet calling themselves Christian. Uh, most of the time, that is the... the the connotation for the word cult because it's trying it says it has a Christian name but it's really not teaching Christian doctrines uh, anything else would just be a false religion or false teaching they also sometimes fall into that word but cult or from some of the word occult and it means that which is hidden and of course that which is hidden we know as a secret and everybody wants to know the secret don't they if you put secret on a title anywhere you will probably get uh, attention caused to, or to be caused to go there because people want to know the secret, whatever it may be. Secret to lose weight, the secret to find eternal life, the secret to, you know, have a lot of money, the secret to this, the secret to that, and the other. But in fact, there is no secret, and that is the biggest secret, <laughs> that there is no secret as such. And so what we have is the occult. It's the same old thing. World-renowned anthropologist and a practicing shaman. Today's word for witch doctor is shaman. It's used all over the world. The last two decades they've used this term, and it denotes any and all witch doctors, witches, warlocks, however you want to call them. It's all under the category of shaman these days. Okay, So Michael Harner is one of those. He confirms that people all over the globe have been practicing witchcraft, sorcery, the same way for thousands of years. Even though separated by hundreds of miles, not having any contact with others, they still engage in the exact same practices. And it's an interesting thing because it's universal. Here are some of the signs. Notice the swastika, which is a Hindu symbol. Here's some other pictures. You'll see examples of witchcraft, warlock, occult practices, teachings. <coughs> Some of the rituals and paraphernalia do change from region to region, but they all have the same core belief and goal, okay? And that they're ministering to spirits of another world and not to the Holy Spirit. That's to spin your head around that thought. Here you see the main symbol we're going to be talking about, a serpent, the snake, the dragon, any one of those names have been used by God in the Bible, who's the only one that truly tells us about the actual character of the snake, the dragon. <coughs> Excuse me. And everybody else seems to revere it. We have many symbols. This is on an amulet. The one prior is an arm ring that you see on the left. Many examples could be given. The serpent or the dragon are the main benevolent figures in the world of cults and religions. Benevolence like the serpent is who gives us life, who created the universe. Totally opposite of what the Bible tells us. This is why any and all false teachings will come to the same conclusion, meaning the serpent is God. And isn't that what he's telling everybody? But since mankind was too smart for that, Adam already knew his God. And so did Eve. So he talked Eve into believing that she could be like God even though Satan wants that position. He tells us in Isaiah that I will be like the Most High, El Elyon, the Most High God. And so that is really his status that he desires, or the status that he desires, but he can't have it. And he knows you and I wouldn't give it to him unless he lies about it. And so he tells us we can be gods. And so through us, he has that title, do you understand? Not us believers, but us who don't believe the truth about the scriptures. 
Many depictions here we see the fork of tongue right there curling up and down of a dragon. Here's another one with ugly teeth. These are old buildings, not only in temples, but you find some of these. Some of these look like gargoyles that you see. Even downtown Lafayette has them on some buildings. Look like demons. Uh, all churches of the past, the big cathedrals as in Europe, you know, the huge hundred feet high, several hundred feet high towers and all this opulence and gold and silver and everything of some of the major religions of the world are nothing more than pagan temples. They are not churches of the Lord God. And here we see a Chinese example right here of a dragon, of course. A dragon is one of the things the Chinese revere. In Haitian voodoo, the great serpent is the fountain of all true wisdom and the creator of the universe. Wow, what an opposite idea of what we just sang about, wasn't it? And there's a depiction. You see the serpent and a man. He took the rainbow for his wife, the story goes, and from that came blood and all the creatures. Now, is that easier to believe than God created the world and God loves you? That he spent, spent his, only, his, his own blood through his son on the cross? I mean, are you going to believe that? People do all over the world. They have no proof. They just don't want what God says. God says, you know what, I have rules. Because without him, you're going to destroy yourself. Just follow the rules. I made them. Here they are. In fact, if you don't follow them, you can't live. Well, they don't want to hear that. So they make up their own rules or are rule-less or lawless. As a final gift, they taught the people to partake of the blood as a sacrament that they might become the spirit and embrace the wisdom of the serpent. God forbade the Hebrews to partake of the blood, for life is in the blood. When you kill the animals, it must be drained even today. If you go out and shoot a deer, this is a deer season, you've got to take it, you've got to gut it, and you're going to let it drain. You cannot, it's not healthy to eat the blood of any animal. Yet many cultures in the world today, especially in Africa, drink blood. South American, ancient Inca, Aztec, and so forth have taken blood rituals and have uh, take, actually eat, eaten the blood. You see this in, uh, oh, uh, oh, the... The big western where uh, Kevin Costner plays in it, uh, the the Sioux Indians and all that. Dances with wolves. Yes, what is it again? Dances with wolves. It dances with wolves. I couldn't think of the name. In there, they have a scene where they finally get the buffalo hunt, and the guy cuts the heart out with all the blood, and just takes a bite and gives it to Kevin Costner. You see this everywhere. This was this is why American Indian cultures uh, were pagan. And all this acceptance today of indigenous cultures, we'll get into that in a little bit, is not biblical. It's a very good book. Serpent snakes found everywhere. Snakes are found on temples throughout Asia and South America. You see some examples here. It is the leading figure in Hinduism from which religion, everything else sprang into existence ever since the Tower of Babel. Every belief system that's not true Christianity is somehow spun from Hinduism. C.S. Lewis once said there's only two belief systems in the world, Christianity and Hinduism, and everything else comes from the latter. And he's absolutely right. The Medusa, the god Serapi, was encircled by the coils of a great snake in Egyptian and Roman temples. And there's the Medusa with, uh, with her hair as snakes, or snakes for hair. This was very, very uh, popular in the world culture, Greco-Roman. There's the god Serapi encircled by a snake. You see how people make depictions because this is what they truly believed. It wasn't just artwork. There's another picture of the Medusa. We took this in Ephesus when we toured Ephesus in, in uh, Turkey. And you see the snake head there. This is the, one of Caesar's temple entrances that they've restored. So it was very, very common. Zeus, of course, is the god of the Greeks, the main god. And he's pictured in the same way. You can't, the picture's not real clear. There's snakes all around the throne up in there in, in curls. God of the underworld, Quetzalcoatl, savior of the Mayans, is their feathered serpent. He's the underground. Why would you look down to find God? 
when even in your heart, without hearing anything, without reading anything, without being brainwashed by anyone or anyone's teaching, you know that you look up to God. It's natural for all of us, but they're saying they're going to go down to the underworld. And here's a depiction, and look what this guy is doing. He's eating a human. Sounds like somebody I want to worship. And you do know I'm kidding. Snake dancing. The annual snake dance of the North American Hopi Indians. Serpent worship in some form permeated nearly all parts of the earth. The serpent mounds of the American Indians. <coughs> Look at this thing. This is huge. You see this? All the way, I don't know, it's several hundred feet from here to here. Why would you do that? That's a lot of work, first of all. <laughs> There's design involved. This was done not with, you know, backhoes and bulldozers. This was done by hand hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The snake and the serpent or the devil is worshipped in the world, folks. He's even held up in many so-called churches. The carved stone snakes of Central and South America, the hooded cobras of India. There's some more. We saw that earlier. There's a guy uh, causing a cobra to be in a trance and dance up. Very common, very popular. There's another shot of a cobra. Python, the great snake of the Greeks. Sacred serpents of the Druids. Midgard, snake of Scandinavia. Notice she's in a tree. Notice it's a she. Isn't that interesting? And of course, all the flying dragon and all that. There were fire-breathing dinosaurs. The book of Job uh, confirms that. God did create them, but they had nothing to do with Satan. The Nagas of Burma, Siam, and Cambodia. There's an oriental depiction. The mystic serpent of Orpheus. All these are depictions. Why? Because they're venerated. It's not just artwork. People believe this stuff. Snakes like the Oracle of Delphi. And here's another picture of Zeus. You know where we took this picture? This is from a poster hanging in the Acropolis restaurant. We love to eat there. It's a great place. People are great. You know, this is part of their culture. They don't think nothing of it. Um, they, they, are, they, they would uh, profess to be Christian. They belong to the uh, uh, Orthodox Greek church, okay? But, you know, this kind of stuff, if you're going to have a Greek restaurant, you have Greek stuff, and this is what Greek stuff contains. This is what it's made up of, okay? When we were in Ephesus, we were bombarded in our face with blatant, pictures and depictions of uh, uh, humans and, and, and snakes and everything else that should never be, but that's part of the culture. Still today, 2014, the sacred serpents preserved in the Egyptian temples. There you see a depiction. You see the snake right there, and people are all hugging it and playing with it. The Uraeus coiled upon the foreheads of the pharaohs and priests. All these bear witness to the universal veneration in which a snake was held. The snake is still held. See this little ditty right here? That's the Uraeus. Okay. It's actually a cobra. There was a close-up. Because they have always revered the snake. Was the devil somewhat successful? Yeah. The majority of people are going to the lake of fire. The Bible clearly says... Because of this, the serpent is a symbol and prototype of the universal Savior who redeems the world by giving creation knowledge of itself. You are really God. You just don't know it yet. The Enuma Elish, of course, is an ancient document, Babylonian document, that first described, the oldest that we know of, first described a self-realizing universe. Well, how can something come from Nothing. It can't. God was there in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. <laughs> and the Word was with God and the Word was God. But this serpent has long been viewed as the emblem of immortality or eternity. It is the symbol of reincarnation, which is mathematically totally impossible. If you, that's just one simple way to disprove incarnation. 
It is a life from the pit of hell. Here you see a scaled snake uh, figures. They meet at the top. And look at these two llamas. They're on their knees and they're paying homage by their posture to this snake. This is from the Himalayas. We find it everywhere, folks. The Caduceus, a Euscapulus, the god of medicine to the Greeks and Romans, and whose symbol, the serpent entwined staff, is used as a symbol for modern medicine. You've seen the symbol. There it is. Every hospital, doctor's office, you know, nurse's station, or whatever has this. Not biblical. Somebody, well, that's, you know, God, Moses, and the serpent, and, and if I be lifted up. No, 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 that's not what this is talking about. There's a picture depicting Aesculapius, and notice his pole and the serpent. It comes from paganism, folks. Now, it gets worse than that. Every doctor, up until the 1960s, every doctor that graduated, unless they were really a true Christian and they just didn't repeat the words but got their diploma, would say, I swear by Apollo, by Aesculapius, by Hygieia and Panacea, and by all the gods and goddesses, etc. That's what our doctors have said at graduation, the world over. And of course, it was updated in 1960s to be more modern, but it was still not Christian, it was still pagan. And both are still available, and you can choose which one you want to repeat, I guess. It's a personal force, and Dave Hunt's absolutely right. This is his quote. It would seem that in the honor given to the serpent in all cultures and religions, we have an admission that the force behind the universe is very personal indeed. Wow. Both the Bible and the occult world agree that the serpent is real. They only disagree whether he's man's friend or foe. All the world says the serpent is man's friend, the benevolent one, the savior, the creator. The Bible says, no, it's the enemy. He's a liar, and a liar from the beginning, Jesus said. Wow. And the world believes the lie and don't want to believe the truth. Here you see a goddess of sorts, what she have, playing with two snakes. Here you see those who would call themselves Christians, like in a Southern Baptist uh, extreme weirdo place, and, you know, holding rattlesnakes up and dancing and playing with them. Not biblical. I don't recommend it. People have died doing this. That's to get your attention on it. <laughs> Logical conclusion. What can we conclude? That it's a historical fact. <coughs> of the serpent beguiling even the garden has been turned into the idea that the serpent is the savior of the world. And that's exactly what Satan's goal was and still is. How does he save us? He gives us altered states of mind through drugs and psychology to be able to tap into that force. Luke Skywalker. The force be with you. This is the force they're talking about, the Hinduism force. That movie was a Hinduistic movie to take people, steal their faith away from Christianity if at all possible. See, people don't know this. They think I'm crazy when I tell them this. It's been proven over and over again. Once we tap into this force, we become gods ourselves because it's always been in us to start with. We just didn't know it. Absolute trash. We are not gods. I know that because I'm losing my hair. I can't control my sicknesses when I get sick. I can't control anything. I'm getting weaker, not stronger. God doesn't get weaker. Ever. He doesn't sleep or slumber. He never, he's never on hold when we pray. You understand, I'm not God and I never will be. But by the blood of Christ, I am his child. That's what I'm talking about. Now, in mind cult control, or cult mind control, the cult's ability to control the mind supersedes that of the best military brainwashers. It does. Always has. Cult recruits become unable to think or make decisions for themselves, change personality, cannot decide to leave their cults. This is why you cannot talk somebody out of it as such. Well, why don't you just believe the truth? doesn't work. They have to see it for themselves. They have to be confronted with questions they cannot ask. I mean, they cannot answer. Cults can successfully alter their behavior, ideology, and attitude of individuals. 
People, especially young people who've been caught up in cults, totally disown their parents, their siblings. They have no clue what they're doing in life. Now, I, I put a picture of Adolf Hitler there. That pose he's doing has a purpose. Sometimes he would go and watch me, please. The start your foot like this. This is bringing out the heart. This is getting emotional. This is getting, come on, be with me. He was coached by a pagan who understood mass hypnosis. He didn't come up with this himself. He was coached for years on how to say and what to say and how to say it. When to do this like he's doing there. He's pointing. He's facing blame right there in that particular moment in his speech. When he does this, he's proud of, you know, Deutschland and all that. They all have meaning. And we'll get to some of that a little later too. So cults can successfully alter the behavior, ideology, and attitude of individuals. We see this today in uh, presidential elections. Presidential candidates are also coached. You wear this. You wear your hair this way. You turn your face this way to the camera. This is the makeup you'll have. When you ask a question about the economy, here's what you answer. If you ask about abortion, here's what you answer. These people are coached. You've got to know this. They're not up there like you and I are talking now even. And even this is a setup because I created this some years ago. And I'm making a presentation. Well, when they're up there on stage wanting your vote, they're making a presentation. It's not the truth. They'll say anything to get in. And we know that from history, don't we? Only way to come out is to have a successful intervention. It must break the mind control, find the core personality, return the individual to his or her pre-cold status, and religious conversion is termed mind control. Listen, this is what the government says religious conversion is. You may say, well, I'm a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. His blood covers my sins. And somebody who doesn't care about all that says, yeah, well, I'm going to see if you meet psychological and sociological criteria. Regardless of its doctrinal theological standards. So it means Christianity in their mind is included. <laughs> well, my daughter and my, and my son, they were just really, you know, outgoing. And now they're more conservative. You know, they don't party like they used to. And I'm afraid they're missing out on life. Well, what happened to them? Well, they went, somebody invited them to church. And they, they said they got born again. Wow, must be cult. You see how they're going to tie your faith in with cultism right away. You got to be very careful there because of that definition that they gave it. While these psychological and sociological criteria are not absolute, they fall into a relative continuum from acceptable social and or religious affiliation to unacceptable. All a politician has to do, a mayor, like we just had in Texas, the mayor of Houston said uh, to be anti-homosexual is not acceptable. Therefore, all you pastors in use, and I demand you give me all your writings and all your sermons you've done that is anti-homosexual. She's since rescinded. This is only a week or two ago. It's happening right here, folks. She decided that it was unacceptable. Christianity is unacceptable to her. Well, it's not her decision. <laughs> it's her decision for her own soul, but not for mine, not for yours, you see. But they're doing it anyway. It's all right here in the brain, folks, is what they say. Remember, the brain is not, uh, the brain is a physical entity, but the mind is not. The mind is not physical. The mind, this is an information gatherer and distribution center for the mind, but the mind, you can't see the mind. The mind doesn't have electrical impulses. The brain does. The mind is spirit. And for all these reasons is why Satan has changed people's worldviews on what's right and what's wrong behavior in all aspects of life. Here we see, you know, the thinker, which is Gnosticism, knowledge. Knowledge gets me to be closer to God. And, of course, the crowd follows, you know, the, the balance, you know, the justice and all this. Justice is blind, which is a bunch of nonsense. Earthly justice is not blind. Truth doesn't matter in a court of law. What matters is what can you and whom can you influence and persuade that's what matters never forget it we've been to court several times for our local matters with our businesses in the past we've won all but one case 
and it because we had our act together, da 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 da. We had everything together. It was our presentation. It was everything else. We were right in our estimation, and if I judge myself from biblical estimation, we were right. We were right to in what we did. We were right to take it to court. We were right. But that didn't matter. What mattered was our presentation and what we were able to put forth, and the other guy. That's what matters, folks. If you don't have all your ducks in a row, you're going to lose in court. If you don't have all your ducks in a row, you're going to get a sad boyfriend and her husband. If you don't have all your ducks in a row, you're going to have a, a trash life. That's a fact. Have your ducks in a row in everything you do. Cleaning the trash when you deprogram people. And this, guilt, this is for you and I when you run into somebody that you might see more than once for whatever reason, maybe school or work or whatever. Maybe they're a neighbor. They live right next to you. You know, you don't bombard them with anything. You show them your Christ's love by your life. Okay? But the only thing uh, this guy says, he'll, this is not me. The I here is not me. This is a quote. The only thing I do is shoot them questions. I hit them with things you, uh, they haven't been programmed to respond to. This person that I'll reveal in a little bit on the next slide he gets hired by parents and other organizations to deprogram people who have been caught up in cults and get them back to a normalcy if at all possible. I know what the cults do and how they do it. You got to know what the Mormons believe and what they want you to believe when they knock on your door. You got to know what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe and how you can counter them. You don't sit there and discuss a long time, but you say, you know what, what you can bring to me is not right. It's not the truth. You're not going to heaven, you're going to the lake of fire. But here is the truth if you want to listen. And if they want to listen, then tell them some truth. And if they don't, then shut the door. You're done. Nothing you can do. You can't save them. You can't hope to save Nothing. They have to make the decision. So he knows what they do, and that's why he can get behind them. So I shoot them the right questions, and they get frustrated when they can't answer. They think they have the answer. They've been given answers to everything. But keep them off balance, and this forces them to begin questioning, to open their minds. And that's how you get to open the mind when someone questions it. That is a fact even in here. Why do you think I want questions at the end of a sermon? It helps open up your mind, my mind, everybody's mind. If you come here and listen to me or anybody else, and nothing is said, and you go back home, you're going to forget it much sooner than if some sort of engagement was done with speaking, answering, Q&A, okay? It's very, very important, folks. When we come to church, please, saints, you're coming to please God. You're coming to praise God and give Him your time. I mean, how many other days do you give Him your time? School eats up a lot. Work eats up a lot. Personal pleasure eats up even more, doesn't it? Those are the things we got to deal with as saints of God. But this guy, is a, they used to call them deep programmers and now call them exit counselors. And even that might be changed by now. This is probably, I probably put this together seven or eight years ago. It's all still, you know, true today. But this name here uh, may have been changed by now. Ronald Enroth, today many techniques of mind control exist that are far more sophisticated than the brainwashing technique used in World War II <coughs> excuse me, and the Korean War. And the mind control involves little or no overt physical abuse. You don't have to slap people around and, and torture them. Instead, hypnotic processes are combined with group dynamics to create a potent indoctrination effect. Destructive cults commonly induce trances in their members through lengthy indoctrination sessions. This would be Seminars, this will be books, this will be newspapers and, and magazines, this will be special meetings. This is why it's so important to watch uh, the youth, you know, the youth are being called to, to join this Christian supposedly group and that supposedly Christian group when they go to high school and college and onward. We just had two uh, uh, inquiries from uh, some brothers and sisters and from another church that we're, uh, uh, with whom we are acquainted and they ask about a certain college Christian college outfit, so I gave them the truth. Uh, hopefully they'll use it wisely. I was kind of surprised, but I'm glad they came to us. They know we know. This is what we've done. We've studied this. This is not just off the top of my head. I've been doing this for nearly 20 years, this kind of stuff. 
And it's the truth, folks. Everything, those of you that have, that, uh, there's a few people in here in this room that have seen some of these things. And everything that we said is happening is much more in the limelight now than it ever was. It's just coming out. There, there's no, I don't have to backpedal or change any of my views that we've talked about. Because it's the truth. The Bible says we're going down as a world. And Christianity is the only one that's going to be raptured out of here. Be part of it. I know I am. So, magazines, books, TVs, newspapers, speakers, rallies. Rallies are a big one. What do you do in a rally? What do you do in a ball game rally? Yeah, you fire them up. Where they go, woo! What do you do in a rock concert? You fire them up. That's what you do. All forms of media and political influences are used. This is classic Fabian society strategy. One of their, their Fabian is a communistic mindset under which our government is now run and has been since the early 1900s. Fabian was a Roman general and he, his idea of combat wasn't always bang, bang, bang. He says, if I can go over, under, or around to, you know, to, to defeat my enemy, I will. And that's the mindset these guys have done and they've used it with finances. This is not my subject now, but I needed to explain that a little bit. And so remold it near to the heart's desire. Pray devoutly, hammer stoutly. They have a stained glass window that's a Fabian window. It's really, really famous. And in there they have a guy like this and opposite him another guy like this and between them is a globe. And that's, that's where it says this. Uh, remold it nearer to the heart. So they're molding the earth how they want it to be. That's the idea. And that's what this is. It's socialism to the max, which is another word for communism. Here you have lengthy indoctrination sessions. Word of faith doctrine is promoted by the Copelands. Here you, uh, uh, whoops. Here you have uh, Ken and Gloria Copeland, Joyce Myers. All these are false teachers. Benny Hinn. Paula White and her husband, she's got a big ministry. She and he are reported to have been a thing. Who knows? These guys got divorced. It's a mess, folks. They are liars. And people tell me that love these people, saying, oh, you're just too harsh. You're just a legalist, blah, 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 blah. You're not in love, Walt. I'm in love because I'm telling you, this, these people are liars. And if you can't recognize us, where is your knowledge of God's word? How can it be that much different from mine? The Bible says what it says. This guy got into some homosexual issues. He had a church of 32,000 in Atlanta. Are you kidding me? You think he influenced a few people? And of course, Creflo Dollar once said that I'm glad my, my, my name isn't Creflo Penny because he teaches a lot of, you know, money, money, money. Nonsense, folks. These are just few of the many, many, many more. Doctrinal social aberration. Doctrinal aberration, listen to this, should be or should distinguish the cults from Christianity, not merely social aberration. Remember, the, the government says, no, it's socially too. If you start doing this and go to that, you know, do social behavior, then we're going to classify you as a cult. Well, it should only be doctrinal. You and I got to know the doctrines, the teachings of the Bible. So that we can then take that knowledge and say, wait a minute, what you're telling me sounds like Hinduism. Doesn't sound like the Bible. Doesn't sound like Peter, James, and John and all the rest of the writers. And if you can't do that, you need to get in the word more. Please, get in the word more. Because the idea is to force the cultist to come to terms by his own volition as to what he or she believes to be truth. They've got to realize it on their own or you're not going to change anyone's mind. All you're going to do is an argument and waste your time. And the reason I bring all this up is because we run into this when we witness to people who are of a different belief. Sadly, many fall from Christianity because they don't know what Christianity actually is, and that ignorance stems from the fact that they don't know the scriptures. It's just that simple. First Thessalonians says we gotta test all things. Only by intimately knowing the word of God will anyone accept being duped in what they actually believe. Or escape rather, escape being duped. What did I tell you Christianity was a long time ago? It's a personal relationship between an individual and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not religion. So only by intimately knowing the word of God will anyone escape being duped into what they actually believe. 
And you know what? You've got to decide what you believe. I've got to decide what I believe. People who say, well, I just don't know which I believe, they've already made up their mind. They made up their mind not to believe. And that's just as bad as not, not believing. It's actually a sin according to God. Mark 4 tells us the soul so is the word. Of what is spoken, now get this, 67% is communicated through body language. You know, remember? Her, 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 her. All of that tells you more than what I say. 67%. And you can give or take a few percentage points. You know, everybody, this is an average. 26% is communicated through intonation and gesturing. What do you, what do you know about me when I go, eh. <laughs> It tells you something, doesn't it? It's information. How about hand signs? Hello. Come. Go. Stop. In the Orient, this has come. Well, this is, yeah, this has come. We do, we do go. See, we go that way. They go this way. It's crazy, isn't it? But it is, it tells us something. Now look at this. Only 7% communicated by speech. If I speak a thousand words to you, 70 will be communicated to you. That's a fact. Whether it's Christianity, whether it's paganism, whether it's you know, job training, whether it's buying an ice cream cone. Okay? There is the key right there. The Holy Bible for all of us. God's word is true. Now here's some twisting of scripture. This is important stuff. This is more important than previous. I just did the previous to bring you up to this point. That the world is pagan. They believe in, in, in devils. They believe in all kinds of things that they call God. Common denominator of all cults and lies is a twisting of scripture. They destroy actual meanings of scripture, pervert known terms in science, medicine, politics, etc., and our scientific age has given birth to names, terms previously unheard of. So we have a brand new language. And this is used as an excuse to also alter what already exists. They can say, well, look at all these new words. I know that the European languages have picked up much English just because of the Internet. You know, everybody has the word net. Everybody has the word page. Email. Those are all English, but they're used in France and Germany and Poland and, you know, everywhere where English is not the national language. And you have English terms that have been used like that or in America. So we have languages that have new, new words that did not uh, originally belong to that language. The medium, well, it's advanced technology and communications via satellites for everything from video to all kinds of sound and surveillance apparatus. We're in the process now of finding out uh, what it's going to take to do some stuff here without having the internet in this particular location. So we're engaging in this, but we're engaging in this, in this technology for something decent. <laughs> you understand? There is a difference. The technology itself is neither good nor bad. It's just what it is. It's technology. They trashed the Bible. Our seminaries are inundated with politically correct interpretations of, alre of already written biblical truth. This is where the emergent church comes in, or what they call the emergent church. Emerging means it comes out of a fluid or something. It's emerging. It's, it's birthing. Well, the church isn't birthing. The church was birthed 2,000 years ago on the cross. You see? Oh, never mind that. We don't, yeah, I know they used to believe that back when grandma did, but I don't believe that. I believe there's new thing. We got to have a new thing. I just don't dig all this stuff about God, you know? And the sin, I don't know. I'm a nice guy, you know? See, this is how we generalize things. And God said, no, 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 you're overstepping my bounds. Dr. Tilly of the University of Chicago's Divinity School has really screwed things up. And Dr. Bernard Rum is a critic of this guy. And he rightly says, Dr. Rum charges that Tilly has so radically redefined standard theological terms that the effect upon Christian theology or the teaching of Christianity is nothing short of cataclysmic. Now listen, such biblical notions as sin, guilt, damnation, justification, regeneration, etc. all come out translated into a language that is foreign to the meaning of these concepts in the scriptures themselves. Sin is no longer sin. Oh, you're just sick. Yeah. 
Oh, he's just sick. Look what Jeffrey Dahmer did. He's just sick. No, he's not sick. If he were sick, they could be fixed. If he were sick, it wouldn't be his fault. He's full of sin. He was a sinner. Guilt. You all have it. All you got to do is ask God's forgiveness and you get rid of this nonsense. The devil pushes this on you. Damnation if you don't accept the gospel. Well, damnation. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's really true. Well, the Bible says it is. Don't listen to me. Listen to what the Bible says. That's the point. And the rest, same thing. <clears throat> Qualifying term now, the Roman Catholic, that Jesus is not the Jesus. There he is, and that's not Jesus of the Bible. We don't know, what, this guy here is not Jesus. You understand? Even the depiction, the, the idea behind the depiction is totally wrong. Jesus said, well, God said, do not make any image of me, of anything on earth, under the earth, in the sky. Don't make an image because I'm a spirit. And if you make an image, you put me in a box, and then I'm no longer me. The Roman Catholic Mary, Mary is not the Mary. This is pagan right here, paganism. This is trash to the max, all of this. Oh, Walt, you're really harsh. And, you know, we have Catholic brothers and sisters. Well, if we do, they need to leave Catholicism because it's also trash. It is a perversion of the gospel of God. I'm hard because what else am I going to be? You know what time it is? People are defecting true faith right and left. And if they want to do so, yeah, but not without me giving the chance to say, you know what, you need to get right. The same holds true of any cult or religion that claims Christian, Christian ancestry like the Mormons do and others. The Gnostic Gospels or the Apocrypha are not canonized because they cannot be substantiated as can the 66 books of the Bible. Many people ask me about this. These are extra-biblical books. There's about 12 or 13 of them, main ones. Uh, we can get some historical value from this, but they are not God's Word dictated to His people. They are not part of the Bible. The Gnostic Gospels are not the Gospels of the, of the Lord Jesus. They're not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Gnostic Gospels are... Uh, writings that people have done about God, but they are not stamped by God. They're not signed off by God as being His Word. You understand? So the Gnostic Gospels, of which there are many too, has to do a lot of angelology in here. And, you know, angels told, angel so-and-so told me and all this stuff. You know why? Because it's like a secret. and People love that. They love what they don't know. That which is hidden. The occult. They love the occult. Because you want to, I want to be the first one to know. It's what an egg hunt's all about, isn't it? I want to find those eggs. I want to find that treasure. I want to find me. I want to find God. Wow, it's really me? How come I didn't know that? Help me find me. Well, pay me $20 million and I'll yoga you over there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's crazy. Roman Catholicism, of course. The World Council of Churches, total trash. The Mormons... Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. Seventh-day Adventists, trying to live in two different covenants, you can't do it. The Christian Science Churches, has to do with Gnosticism also, knowledge. The World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People, I mentioned it earlier. You have a bunch of American Indians that say they're saved, and they keep doing their fire dance and their snake dance because it's part of their culture, and they say God's okay with that. God's okay with you being an American Indian. He's okay with your bloodline, your family, just like he is my German or your Spanish or Hispanic or Italian or whatever it may be. That's okay. But if I take the pagan part of the Germans, which Hitler did, and others, and I try to marry it with what I know about the, God, the Bible, I'm in sin. And I'm a liar. I can't do it. Now when it comes to Blattwurst, Stuff like that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. See, that's got nothing to do with Christianity one way or the other. <laughs> and I'm happy about that. <laughs> that right, Danny? <laughs> the New Apostolic Reformation. This is something that was one of the big organizations started by C. Peter Wagner. He passed away now, I think. And uh, 
And now he knows better too, a liar major. He called himself an apostle, which is bad enough and unbiblical enough, but he called himself a horizontal apostle. In other words, he is a foundation layer. Well, I thought the foundation was the Bible, which of course it is. The word faith, teachings, we talked about that. Many others I could reform the Calvinism, total nonsensical teachings they have. Very, very dangerous. You need to be very careful. Now here's some trends. This is what I want you to get. In the ongoing debate of a Bible translation, little mention has been made of the way new Christian books are written and edited. And this is a few years ago already. But in actuality, the demand Bibles. Take man out. Take he out. Any male uh, uh, pronoun or any of that, take it out. Even though God put it in there, they're taking them out. They're continuing in a larger publishing trend. Everybody's doing this. Editors are changing authors' words without the consent of the author. Is that right? Even unbiblically, even not even considering the Bible. Is that right? No. <coughs> InterVarsity Press, one big one. They changed J.I. Packer's and the Apostles' words when they rendered the phrase new man, as it says in the Bible, as a new human being. You say, what's the big deal? The big deal is God didn't say a new, new human being. He said a new man. And neither did J.I. Packer. Well-known Christian writer Packer discovered the change shortly before press time men complained. I'm not promoting Packer. He leans uh, a lot to the Calvinistic side. Full-blown Calvinist, I believe. So I don't agree with much of what he says. In fact, 90% of it. But he was right in, in opposing this. I don't care if you write a trash book. If my, if my publisher wants to change my words, can't do it, then I didn't write it. How can they put me down as author if they're going to change my words as they like it? You see what I'm saying? Can't do it. But this is happening with Christian stuff. Paco won out, but only because he's well known and respected. And here's the reason for the change, that women were excluded by the phrase new man. Is, do you guys feel, you women in here, you feel excluded by that phrase? I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. On its website, the use of man, mankind, fireman, and just about every man-based word except woman is forbidden. This is a supposedly Christian publisher. How about... William B. Erdman's, another longtime so-called Christian publisher, theological publisher, they said that, quote, masculine genders are not welcome. Wow. See, now they're right in your face. They're not just asking you. They're telling you we're not doing this. Quit sending us manuscripts that look like that. And here's another excuse. And I quote, our reason was that we agreed that exclusively masculine pronouns privilege masculine gender, and we understood that to continue to use exclusive language would cause offense to many of our readers. What a bunch of nonsense. No one has written in and said, oh, I read he the other day. <laughs> I was so upset after that I couldn't cook. <laughs> I mean, it's stupid. These, these excuses are publicly given by intelligent men and women who worked for these publishers. And when they say that that was the reason, many people don't even question it. That was not the reason. That reason doesn't exist. It's trash. It's a lie. Complete and total lie. Do authors ever object? Managing editor of Erdman's, Charles von Hof, reveals, we have had authors specifically ask that we not render their language gender inclusive. And since such requests generally come from scholars whose stature whose stature entitles them to impose their will. We almost always complied. Well, this is a lie anyway. How do you almost always? Either you always or you almost, but you don't almost always. So here he is, a, a, a publishing person. You don't even know what he's saying. But worse than that, whose stature, whose stature, whose stature, what does Christ say? What does God say? No, be not a respecter of persons. He's coming against God's word just by that. Now, who looks at it like this? Now, nah, people just go, they blow right through that, don't even realize it. He's coming against God's word. He's coming against God. 
in his, uh, in his, in his thought, in his understanding, in, and what he's in trying to get authors to do. But such requests are more and more infrequent. Most of our authors are still, quote, submit manuscript using gender-inclusive language because they're forcing him to. When they don't, and they don't evince a preference, look what they do. We quietly and professionally edit it, usually without objection. Wow. You send your manuscript that you've worked hard on, your heart's in it, your mind's in it, and you send it in, and they suddenly change it without telling you. But they do it quietly and professionally. You see how this is a lie? How this is totally wrong? Bethany House, another one. Stay with me. Editorial Vice President Carol Johnson states, and I quote, We ask our authors and editors to avoid gender-specific pronouns wherever it is appropriate and whenever it can be done with simplicity and grace. Wow, isn't this Christian sounding? Especially that one. We encourage, as she's still speaking, we encourage inclusive language because this is the direction English is going <laughs> and because when it's all said and done, it is more accurate. What? That is total trash. <laughs> I mean to tell you. Baker Books and Brazier Press. They had a, this is 2002. I guess I must have done this in 2003 or 4. So that's how old this information is. And is it relevant? Absolutely. Editorial uh, Director Rodney Clapp comments, quote, We accept the concern that a constantly masculine language for positions of leadership and power really can and does constrict women in the exercise of their gifts. Wow. He's saying that they have gifts. That puts it in the spiritual. What they're saying is, Father God is wrong. We're not going to do it. We're not going to say God is a he. What did Jesus call him? It? Whatever you want to be? They're telling us this today, folks. You can go to the hospital, have a child, give birth to a child, and the birth certificate have on there either or. I'm serious. And, and there's a provision in some states on that same birth certificate that whatever you decide now, when that child gets to be a teenager, they can change to being from a boy to a girl if they want to. Uh, insurance companies are more and more and more paying for sex changes. They won't pay for a full dental job, but they'll pay for the sex changes. We're talking millions of dollars. Are you kidding me? Are we going down? Yes. Are we going down? No. no, the world's going down. Hallelujah. Kids, please, I can just beg you to believe me, but don't believe me. Believe God's word, I'm telling you. You need to know what you believe. You're going to get bombarded and slapped in the face with so many lies in your later school and work and all that till Jesus comes. And the rest of us still too, but some of us are older. We're a little bit more tough. My skin's more rough. I'm like a dinosaur. My scales cannot be penetrated. <laughs> No way, Wiley. <laughs> Most of our authors are careful not to overdo masculine pronouns in reference to God. Wow. Now we're overdoing it. And some aren't. Look how bold this person is. We recognize that in the past, masculine language for God has sometimes been illegitimately used to reinforce the subjugation of women. Any man that mistreats his wife, his children especially his female children, is not a man of God. I don't care what they claim. Any man that has done this to women is a scum bucket. It has nothing to do with God or his masculine or not masculine. You understand? But they're using this problem, which is go on, you know, does go on, wife beatings and abuse and all that. This does go on. And they don't get paid enough on the job, even though they may do the same. All that stuff goes on, but it's got nothing to do with this. <laughs> you understand? Wow. And here they are putting it together, trying to make it a, an, a, an excuse. And, of course, they are ridiculous. And they're all feeble excuses for removing the male gender. These assertions, unfortunately, drive the wheels of communication in this world today. Folks, it's not going away. This is getting worse. While not all publishers practice the aforementioned censorship, they soon will. The word man in any literature has always and does now mean human being people, men and women alike. 
Zoologists have long used the terms man as in man inhabits all the climactic zones. Are they really wanting us to believe that man is telling anybody that no women or children were there? It's ridiculous. Logicians have said man is mortal. Are women not mortal? Of course, because it means mankind, human people. Philosophers have boasted man's unconquerable mind. All these examples are, everybody knows what that means. You kids, when you read philosophers have boasted man's unconquerable mind, do you have a distinction between men and women? No, it's just human beings, right? Hallelujah. So man could not possibly mean male only. The inclusive sense of human being is not an arbitrary convention. It's always been what it is. Whoops. The Sanskrit root for man is manu, and it means nothing but the human being and does so par excellence, since it is cognate with the word for I think. Here's a problem, though. Here where Gnostics or those into knowledge have taken that phrase, this fact, man means I think. They've taken, and this is really because the God part in us. And they said, I think, therefore I am. How they married this truth with God, because God is the great I am, you see. And this is how they've done it. So they took a truth, man means I think, but just because we think, don't make us gods, does it? I don't see a God out there sitting here, and you don't see one standing before you. And I'm thankful for that. And the compounds that have also been rejected in today's mentality, such as chairman, postman, fireman, and the like, man retains that original sense of human being, as is proved by the word woman, which is etymologically the wife human being. God only created Adam. He never did create Eve. Eve came from Adam. He built upon one of his ribs, as it goes, or a piece of his flesh. It could mean either one, and he built one. But it came from Adam. He started with Adam, whereas Adam, he started with dirt. Now, I know that sounds a little dirty, <laughs> but that was a good thing. So let's be fair. If fairness is the reason for all this absurd change of language, then all divisions of humanity require their separate mention when referring to the mass. And the listing must not end with men and women, but also teenagers and children. And many people do actually do this. This is why we see we're separating the family. The devil has separated the family. The serpent has separated the family. We now have youth groups. We have, we have uh, a women's meetings where the husband shouldn't be there. And we have men's meetings where the wife shouldn't be there. Biblically speaking, husband and wife are the one who is to bond. Not a bunch of women getting together or a bunch of men getting together. They can do so, but to make a deal out of it. And oh, we have men's meetings and women's retreats and men's events. All this nonsense is ridiculous. They get nothing done anyway. Because in the end, you know what? Men and women both do this. Do a bunch of yapping. The top 100 books and book sales, Christian book sales for 202. Three dealt with apologetics, defending the faith, with evidence for faith and how to answer critics. Three out of 100. Six are about the Bible. Out of 100 <laughs> Christian books. Four are about Christ. Two are about the Holy Spirit, and one is about the church. Wow. So what are all the rest about? There was only one left which dealt directly with the gospel, that salvation comes from being forgiven thanks to God's grace through the work of Christ. Hallelujah. Only one book out of 100 actually told the gospel story, told somebody how to get saved. All of these are good, but they, don't, they weren't for the unbeliever. They were for the believer who already figured, you know, was working on it. I'm not saying they were good. I don't know. I didn't read them, but they were probably okay if you have a discerning mind. Most books are about what we do rather than what God has done. For example, how-to books such as How to Find God's Will Through the Power of the Holy Spirit. This is kind of nonsense that's selling like hotcakes out in the bookstores. From many of their spiritual how-to books, one could easily get the opposite impression that salvation is about works after all. Well, yeah, that's what... Satan wants us to believe you've got to work for it. But God says you can't work for it. It's free. Free to everybody. Here we have the Medusa again in the temple. I'm almost done. This is Yale University. This is the library. It's fashioned like a church on purpose. It's also built to make look old. This is not old. This was done in the uh, 1930s. This is where our 
presidents go to school and learn, you know, different uh, uh, socialistic ways of running things politically, monetarily. This is where Fabian ideas are taught. This is where Gnosticism really rears its ugly head, and I'll prove that to you. This is the uh, mural at the Li Yale Library. This is the uh, alma mater, which is a female goddess, basically. See, it's made to look like a church, but it's not a church. They call it a library. And, of course, this isn't a church either because this resembles what? An old-time cathedral, which were really just temples of Satan anyway. Here, you can't read some of that. It's too small. So I have... The truth is depicted nude and carrying mirrors. I believe that's right there. Music is identified by a harp. It's one of these guys in here. It's, it's all, this is all surrounding her. I'll just not look for it. But divinity by the tablets and cross-governed gown. You know. So what do the white tablets? Because they're trying to marry it to the Bible because Moses had the tablets. It's not really what they're talking about, but that's what people will think and they know it. And the literature by a quill and a scroll. You know, intelligence and all that. And the... Mother goddess garbed in a white gown and blue mantle, the official university colors. You know, the bushes went there. Uh, Skull and Bones is there. Skull and Bones Society. This is pagan as can be, folks. Now look at this. This is outside the building. You see this eagle? This is, looks real close to what the Nazis used, but it's also what Rome used. Here you have an inverted swastika, him, him, uh, Hindu sigil. Here you have a bunch of cuneiform writing. Here you have an astronomer. Here you have a sculptor. See, art and science. Knowledge is lifted up. Knowledge, knowledge, science, art, art, science, art, science. That's what the Enlightenment period was all about. Here you have uh, a scholar. Here you have someone. Oh, look at him. He's praying. Isn't he holy? He must be a Christian. I don't think so. Here's another guy who knows who this guy is, but he's, you know, he's carrying some scrolls. So, so he, again, he has knowledge. It's all about knowledge, folks. And all the other little, you know, designs in here is all pagan stuff. Look at this one. This is classic Illuminati owl. Classic Illuminati. This is on our dollar bill, too. You can't find it except for with a microscope, but it is there. Not a, not a real powerful one. You can see it. Again, some more, whoops. Again, some more writing here. And again, you have... Uh, Middle Eastern looking person. You have a Greek here who's of course a scholar and you have, uh, I'll go to this in a minute here, and then you have a Oriental looking person because they got to add everybody and this is most likely a, a depiction of Confucius and here you have an Assyrian or Babylonian which is today, which is the forefathers many people think of today's Europeans. This right here is very interesting. This is a wolf and she's suckling two babies, two human babies. What would that possibly mean? Well, this could only mean Romulus and Remus, the two twins that were born and their parents uh, died or something in an avalanche or in an uh, earthquake or something. And so they were raised by, by a she-wolf and they are said to have founded Rome. The Roman kingdom, the Roman uh, uh, empire. Today's Europe, today's European Union is a revived Roman empire. This is all leading to this. No wonder our presidents are ate up. So we have this Illuminati owl. We have, look at here, the serpent. See it? Can't be any more clear. It's amazing, folks. This is what we have. This is the world we live in right here. That's why we are not of the world. We are Christians. Our home is not here on earth. Our citizenship is not on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven, where Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. Wow. Here you see another dragon and fire breathing, of course. Kind of bad pictures, I apologize. Here's a brave knight, and he's de you know, destroying a dragon here. And that's the end of that show. Let's pray. Father in heaven, holy is your precious name, Lord. We, we sang praise songs to you. And acknowledge you as creator of the universe, the one true, loving, living God, the truth. And we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for letting us know the difference between your truth and the lie. And the lie has so many faces. And it gets accepted by so many people through so many avenues. 
the avenues of science, the avenues of you know uh, interpretation, the avenues of and skills of uh, writing and, and plays and and what have you, Lord. The lies perpetuated so many different ways, and it's crept into our schools, it's crept into our churches even. I ask that you keep us true to your word, Lord. Allow us not to slip like David said in one of the Psalms, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Let us never fall back. Let us never give you the back of the hand or the talk to the hand kind of a nonsense. Let us obey you, Lord. Forgive us our sins. Be with all persecuted ones. And strengthen us in our witness. We should witness with our lives. And if we must speak words, let it be your words. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much.